Dr. Shekhar is uh, the star of the show, so I just give the intro and then I <laughs> work out. Wonderful, great. Oh, sorry. Hello and good evening. You are watching the Policy Times evening show Unleashing India Global Web Summit Series post-COVID-19 devastation. I mean, we have been talking that COVID-19 has divided the world and the post-COVID era needs a complete revamp, not only in terms of strategy, but also execution. Now, for any nation, the biggest challenge or the biggest parameter of development is uh, of its infrastructure. So if you see nations which have very nice infrastructure are by default or by nature, they are ahead of the others because that also makes them easy for infrastructure development. I mean, uh, to attract a lot of other foreign investment in many strategic sectors, and that leads to many other things. Now, today's discussion is enhanced role for planning infrastructure with good transportation and implementation strategy for national incarnation. The chairman of the show is Dr. P. Shekhar, uh, who is also chairman of Global Smart Cities Panel and uh, author of more than 80 books on different topics of our nation building, also an architect of the concept called secure governance. Also, this is a topic which is close to his heart and he has been working for a couple of decades by now. With him, uh, we are joined by two real experts from this country, worked on the ground for again, several decades on infrastructure development from different sectors. Uh, Mr. Ashutosh Vasant, who is an eminent speaker and a writer for many uh, different strategic uh, national growth issues, also director of Railtail and executive board member of SCOPE, one of the leading uh, associations related to infrastructure development. We have uh, Lieutenant General S. Ravi Shankar, sir, uh, who again needs no introduction, global expert on roads and infrastructure. He was former director general of Border Roads and presently president of ICT. So today I don't want to give a much background on the topic because I'm not an expert and, and, and my job is easy when Dr. Shekhar is here. Couple of points, India needs more than $777 billion or in rupees, 50 trillion rupees uh, for a massive sustainable you know, infrastructure development. So the figures are really high, almost $1 trillion we need. And that is only possible through, you know, very innovative financing, whether through private public partnership or on other means. I'd be very happy our experts will discuss on a lot of this topic. So without taking any more time, I want to request Dr. P. Shekhar to kindly take over this session. Thank you, Akram. We are now touching almost the 40th of the series of sessions. And we are very fortunate that we could persuade two of our best speakers to come back again. And uh, they, are, they really did a very good job in their first, uh, which was slightly a different uh, topic. And today is on infrastructure. And for this, I will just run through a small presentation, very uh, lightly to give uh, inroads to what we are uh, coming up. <clears throat> So as we know, uh, we are talking of uh, enhanced role of planning infrastructure with good transportation and implementation. We have got one of the biggest authorities on transportation, one on uh, uh, railways and one on roads and the two border roads, 7,500 kilometers of borders we have got. And he's a person who has managed for the end of his uh, career as DG border roads. So they would have a lot of very good things to tell. So to give you a preview, Okay. Yes, India as a country, as you know, is almost when we say the challenges are multitude, we are like managing 206 countries put together. But at the same time, you know, there's enough land, enough water, enough good things, and enough troublesome things when you manage a complex country like India. Today, we are reorienting the word growth into reincarnation because the growth would have been really good had it not been for this COVID because we were going out of the challenging time 
to a slightly a victorious time when things were picking up and the whole world has collapsed because of some invisible thing called coronavirus, COVID. Now, COVID is invisible not only in its looks, it is invisible even in numbers, but it is successful in bringing everything down. Fortunately, infrastructure is one thing which it has not brought down because COVID is supposed to be like World War III. World Wars always bring down the infrastructure. Only thing which COVID has not succeeded till now is bringing the infrastructure down in physical sense. Whereas the growth of infrastructure, the planning of infrastructure, all have got very deeply affected, especially with the migrant labor going from very places to places and general management people not knowing where, the funds getting blocked in various avenues. So that is a challenge which our two speakers will uh, even analyze and have some very good solutions. <clears throat> See, infrastructure is the one which brings us to a civilized world. Otherwise, we are all nomads in a forest. So planning of infrastructure needs huge uh, finance. At the same time, it gives very, very large employment and gives the comfort of today's uh, 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 whatever we call as a modern life. So it gets coupled with all uh, things which are uh, needed. So it is, as I said, I'll keep this very short and sweet. So infrastructure is right from airport, seaport, railport, roads, etc., etc., telecom, all come, consists of whatever we call the infrastructure. The money need is almost in lakhs of crores in Indian money and in, in terms of international currency, it is almost trillions of dollars. And the challenges are extremely high because Every road, we only uh, know the road by a pothole which has hit us, which is which is to be repaired. But one doesn't know that 99% of the road is good, but 1% pothole can, uh, you know, uh, not only bring the system down, it also brings the environment into a different uh, uh, phase and which, which, which needs to be attended. So there is uh, challenges of, you know, airport, there is challenges of uh, rail port, which our expert there will tell, I will introducing, you know what great work they have done. At the same time, we should also know that Indian railways and Indian roadways are the large, one of the largest in the world. And yes, two complex terrains. We have got the highest of the highest uh, peaks to be taken. We have got 1,300 uh, islands to be taken care and we got 7,500 coastline to be taken care and uh, one of our uh, experts has managed 7,500 kilometers of the borderlines. Okay, so forecasts are made, forecasts are quite many, uh, uh, again, is in a huge this thing. And secured governance, something where I'm sure you and our experts will uh, tie up. A uh, secured governance is the one where through value valuation, many of the funding requirements can come. Today, there are a lot of international agencies which are ready to fund. The conditions are very stringent, conditions are very not setting. So, how does one take it and how does one manage India's uh, uh, requirement, which are very, very high in this, 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 this um, industry, the one which will require the largest amount of funds because of the complexity. So circuit governance can play a very, very deep role. And <clears throat> I'll directly introduce the speakers now. Now I will first uh, have Ashutosh Vasant. Ashutosh Vasant is a, great technologies and he is a very good planner and he is a thinker far above his domain of work. He is not the one who thinks today I should go to the office and do X, Y, Z, which is my mandate. He thinks a nation first and then himself, then his office. Okay. So the, the, since I know him for the last few years and the way he contemplates, the way he thinks about India and the way he thinks about his own company's work, his own this work, is something which is phenomenal. I'm sure he will bring that into today's uh, lecture. Uh, he's the director in Railtel. He's almost the founder of Railtel 2021 20, years back. And it's one of the most successful public sector enterprises. Public sector enterprises are more known for spending money. Here is a public sector enterprise which, which has not taken much money. It is called Railtel and they proudly say that, you know, we only have 5% of the work with railways. Most of the work is with uh, outside. They also have the claim of having the largest fiber optic network in the world, almost 45,000 kilometers. Okay. 
much of the credit goes to him and is of course uh, he would always like to give the credit to his team and the team have done a very good job and his thinking has been not only railways he think what does railway is doing for the india's economy and he goes far above a normal thinking which i am sure he will highlight right in the beginning and our second speaker is uh, left in general ravi shankar uh, he is somebody who has done almost 40 years in uh, <clears throat> army last few years he has been on as director general border roads one of the most complex jobs because as i told we have got 7500 kilometers of border okay and with absolute uh, you know hostile terrain on this side by the uh, uh, circumstances on the other side by the animosity of the uh, uh, countries okay so on that terrain he has successfully done a lot of work after retirement he has uh, he is uh, on a company which takes care of the consulting which is done for the roadways okay so he he is a roadways expert and he does this on very very challenging terrains so when he speaks i would request him of course to speak on some of the challenges which he has faced during his career and during the post retirement where he has also done very successful uh, work for <clears throat> betterment of the uh, uh, system so coming to our ashutosh ji ashutosh ji please uh, have your uh, uh, views on infrastructure development the challenges and the way things are and the way things has to come out as we say post covid ashutosh thank you sir honored to have such a wonderful introduction but then that in- increases the responsibility because otherwise the best option would be to keep quiet and let the words beautiful spoken by you sail through <laughs> but the reality is how can we see india doing wonders as compared to anybody else very have you seen i see covid as a beautiful opportunity to bring to light the fact that even in spite of all bottlenecks good connectivity can help us do things more efficiently more effectively can increase productivity of every individual can overcome a number of bottlenecks which we face throughout and did not see any value or any solution to it talk about our spend in traveling crore spent in air conditioning more spent on office infrastructure how you can virtually manage all this through connectivity what we are doing today was unthinkable some days back right now you have held 50 seminars similarly scope has held multiple number of seminars educating the public sector employees as well as the world at large everybody is doing this courses are online all interactions are online what it proves is this is bringing a new dimension to improvement in efficiency and effectiveness of each one of us because the time that was otherwise spent in useless travel or on uh, commuting is all taken care of if you have the infrastructure in place that is what is core right so if as you said the right topic on infrastructure whether it is physical whether it is electronic whether it is subliminal or whatever you talk about if we are connected effectively probably together we can do wonders now coming to thinking about i have been just deliberating on what we can do better to further bring value to the country on the whole sir how about making indian railways the amazon of transportation have you thought about it today when you get transferred from one place to another do you think of transporting your goods through railways do you think of sending a box or a parcel of uh, a fresh mangoes that you get in ratnagiri to me in delhi through railways no today you don't think of that but imagine with it with integration with ai with deep learning with machine learning if i can give every individual every small msme or every individual manufacturer across the country the facility to manufacture anything or produce anything in any corner of india and ship to any corner of india for the consumer in defined transit time 
just through an integration of last miles at both ends and a reliable transport of the railways in between imagine what we can do we can disrupt this country we can dis make ease of doing business even better this just requires a solid core it infrastructure ai to ensure that what all material is getting booked from which place to which place and how to stack how to organize train running how to ensure that it gets insured when you are lifting the material gets packed at the producer's place gets delivered at the other end in transit time guaranteed otherwise you pay back and at the other end once it is delivered what amazon is doing for your books we can as railways do it for the business in the country you see value in it second the connectivity has ensured that no longer the Eight or ten metros, or the sixty sixty eight cities, have to be the core of business. You can sit in Sita Pur, Ambika Pur, Chermiri, Jagdalpur, or you can be seat, sitting somewhere in East Siang in Arunachal Pradesh and still manage all your business because you are connected. You can transact, you can pay online, you can ship your samples, you can show people what you are producing, you can share your ideas and create value. so what it points out is basically if we are able to connect people reliably whatever means that may be and integrate this planning i think we are a different country i was listening to one of the mds of a domestic financial company a big company i would not name that the md said that the per kilometer per ton transportation cost in india is one of the highest which makes our business viability a challenge now if we can together think in this direction of reducing the per ton per kilometer cost of transportation by integration of all these means like i was listening to the gst and ceo day before in one of the conferences he said most of the trucks in india 1.8 crores only 10% have a lead of 1000 kilometers dr sir others all are on short distance and the dead mile the returns empty are in huge proportions because there is no integration across now imagine if i can create a exchange wherein all means of transport can exchange information as to what is the load available in which corner of the country which can act as an aggregator i think we are increasing the efficiency multifold then coming back to once we have a beautiful infrastructure in place i then see value in creating distributed economic development across the country so that we eliminate all challenges of rising cost of infrastructure rising cost of living terrible pollutions in metros terrible congestion in metros because no longer you need to be in a metro or a mini metro to search for your livelihood if we can go back to the concept of what gandhi ji preached way years back of gram swaraj making individual villages as centers of livelihood without needing the need to leave your hamlet your society your cultural background your ecosystem i think we can't think of anything more happy more successful more healthier a life than this so my aim is create distributed development of economy across the country so that people get jobs within 50 kilometers of their original habitats if we can do that nothing better than that doctor sir and i have those ideas i would share after uh, yeah. general ravi shankar speaks on his part well, and in the second half i would like you also to cover a little more on the scope yes. which is yep. uh, something where people I Uh, you have done a wonderful job there too Thank now you, uh, coming to general ravi shankar i have given the general introduction uh, i would also request him to give some of the practical aspects he is uh, famous for you know clearing many uh, you know bottlenecks on the way and many you know cobwebs on the way okay. i would like him also to enlighten us on uh, uh, on the way he generally has uh, been successful whether it is a complex terrain uh, in the border roads or in his present uh, uh, avatar in terms of uh, as an evangelist for uh, transportation general avi shankar thank you dr shekar for keeping us on that high pedestal and pasting my photograph in uniform <laughs> it was a nice reminder of the days when i used to wear it 
<clears throat> so I'll just get on by saying that having been in the border roads, it's with great pride one sees all the coverage border roads is getting uh, in the near past with work along the LAC. Tremendous amount of work is going on and uh, some may not have noticed there was not a moment's respite during COVID. They were working, the labor was coming and the work was going on. And with the Rotang Tunnel opening now, something with which I was associated even with the, as the DG Border Roads. Even as the tunnel has been inaugurated, we have heard the first blast of the Zojila Tunnel. So the next phase of crossing the Himalayas has already started. So NHA and MORTH, with whom I've been working closely over the last seven to eight years, have also been growing by leaps and bounds. A lot of work has been happening. And now we are past the pandemic stage where work had come to a halt. One can already see a revival and one can see work progressing. And my guess is that in the next financial year, we are really going to see even the IMF figures show growths of 8.8% next year. So that growth is going to come along with infrastructure also. Uh, I'm more or less certain that this growth will take place as people get adjusted to what is happening. But as we go forward, we have to strap up and see that our basics are all tied up and we grow in a, on a more secure footing. So what I'll do today is just share a few stories uh, which were the experiences I've had. Uh, both these stories are post being the BRO. The first one is related to AH, Asian Highway 48, uh, which runs from the Bhutan border to Bangladesh. This is a project which I was looking after as the authority engineer. And we found that the project was not progressing at all. So I went for a visit to the project and asked the project manager as to what is the reason it is so slow? Why isn't work going? We've tried to do so much for it. The guy was, we were at a bridge site and almost in tears he says, I'm ready to start work, but this is the first time in my life it has happened that I don't have money to buy a bag of cement. So I said, where is all that money gone? We've been trying to get you uh, as much funds as possible, getting your payments and all this thing. He says, but every money that comes is going to the bankers and not coming back to us. Now, why was this happening? The company was Punj Lloyd. I'll take the name. They had already been, uh, they had defaulted on payments of interest and the bankers had taken them to what do you call your NCLT, National Company of Law, uh, Law Tribunal. And the State Bank of India, which was the largest lender, had uh, placed a, an RP, as they call it, a resolution professional who was looking after the funds. So obviously what was happening was every time we paid an invoice of theirs, it was going to the bank and it was not coming back to the project. So I asked him, what do we do? He says, why don't you speak to the bankers? Now that was not my role at all. But then seeing the desperate state, I said, let me talk to the bankers. So I rang up the higher management in Punj Lloyd and they said, we've got the RP visiting us tomorrow. Why don't you also come? So I went and attended that meeting. And uh, so there was the RP in front of me and I was facing him. And uh, he said, General Saab, what do you have to say? I said, I have very little to say. All I have to say is your project is going behind schedule. And if it doesn't progress, I will have to slap penalty on you. The penalty is 0.05% per day. So for a 6, 666 crore project, it was working to about 30 to 35 lakhs per day. 
subject to a maximum of 10%, which is 66 crores. Uh, the next is that the moment I slap this penalty, you'll find the authorities will be looking at your bank guarantees. They'll be looking at the retention money. That totals up to about 70 crores. So now the bankers looked a little worried. They said, General Sahib, do you think these will uh, encash the bank guarantees? I said, they will, unless they are stupid. <laughs> now that got them thinking. I said, there's one more thing you have to worry about. These guys are sitting idle for the last three day, three months. You know how much it costs every month for just idling and all the things they have there, their workshop and this, it costs them almost a crore, crore and a half. I wonder who's paying it. Is Punj Lloyd going to pay it? Or is the State Bank of India going to pay it? But in all these laws, one person who definitely loses, I know, it is the common man because his infrastructure is not coming up, despite all this. Of course, uh, you wouldn't care for him. You're from Bombay and they're from Bengal. So let's not talk of that. The common man is not important. Let's talk of the other things. I was being a little sarcastic there, but this was exactly the time I spent with them. Two minutes. And I said, thank you. Two days later, they released five crores. In the next four months, they released 20 crores. And the project was completed. Uh, this happened in, in June. And the project was completed by November 2019. And all the invoices they put in totaled to 35 crores which means the bank made a neat 15 crores. It's a very simple thing. Unless cash flows, you can't make money. There is no way you can collect money by just holding on to cash. And when I interacted with uh, Punj Lloyd just today saying, I'm taking your company's name, they said, sir, it's a nice story. You must tell it. They said, this resolution professional, the RP, has started using the same terms with their other projects. And today they are seeing the closing of many of their projects. And I think even the bank is seeing their money coming back. It's a very simple, basic thing, which people tend to forget. Even bankers tend to forget. Unless cash flows, cash cannot grow. And I think if you forget such simple terms, there is no future for growth in the country. Related to this, is decisions, timely decisions. When I was young and in the army, I used to take pride in quick decisions. We had the concept of a quick attack and the moment you saw fire coming from somewhere, within half an hour, you launched an attack and dislodged them. That was a quick attack and quick decisions were important. As you grow, you realize that quick decisions is not required. You require timely decisions. Use all the time you have for the decision, but don't give the decision a day late. A decision given late is as good as the decision not given. Uh, why I'm saying this is the attitude towards decision making sometimes I feel has been a little casual. If a government official, having been in the government, I say this now, if a government official delays a decision who pays the price? No finance person puts a cost to it. So actually delaying government decisions is at no cost is what people visualize. But the moment you start costing these delays, you find there's a huge national loss. On small projects, you see this happening. A project is delayed by six months, then it's because of a delay of a decision so you don't penalize even the contractor. And then you compromise saying it was partly yours, partly mine. The project finishes after one year late and nobody is blamed for it because the decision making process was also slow. It's time we started uh, actually putting value to these delays in decisions. And if cash flow is stopped, someone has to be penalized for it. Somebody has to be accountable for it. Unfortunately, all the uh, contracts, as I've seen it, are a little loaded towards the authority, towards the client. And so it becomes very easy for them to stop these things. 
So a little bit of look in from that side and you'll find the whole system will move much faster. And when we have grown so much and when we are looking at growing so much more, I think this is an aspect that we should be focusing on. So this is one experience with one story uh, <coughs> about cash flow and decisions. Uh, the other is uh, about new technology. Everybody says we should use new, new technology, but it's not in pieces. We have to look for gaps. And one such gap, which I would like to talk about, I'll switch to a, a few slides I've made just to make it interesting. Yeah. Are you able to see the slide? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. We're talking of new generation modular bridges. And <clears throat> the story I'm telling you is set in the Kedarnath, beautiful Kedarnath Valley. The Yatra route is NH7 up to Gaurikund here, after which it's a 14 meter trek to the shrine. And my story is about this bridge here at Son Prayag uh, on the confluence of Son Ganga and the Mandakni River, which had faced those devastating floods in June, 2013. So this is the bridge. The third bridge, it is 60 meters span, double lane, permanent, launched in, in March 2016. Floods in 2013 was false, launched in 2016, and it's the third bridge. What about the first and second? Why three years gap? I'll just explain that now. Now, after the floods, this was the scene. The first bridge had been washed away. It was a 60 meter bridge. And even the gap, which was 60 meters, has reduced to almost 30 meters now. But this is a bogus gap because all this is landfill and it can get washed away anytime. And the bridge that they made was this 33 meter bridge. It can take a maximum load of 12 tons. It's 4.2 meters, which means it is single lane. And this was the build. This was built in September 2013, just after the floods. So why did they stick to this bridge? Because this Bailey Bridge was the only equipment available in the country at that time for an emergency. So what happened to this? In 2015, when we were there, uh, actually in April 2015, when we saw all these places and they asked for suggestions of changes, we told them, this bridge is not safe. We gave it to them in writing and we said it needs a change. In June, this is what happened. There was a second flood and you can see all this fill just disappeared. If the bridge is stuck at this end, it's because after we told them, they chained it at one end. So they could at least retrieve the bridge. But this is what happened to a bridge which is too small, which is too light, and which is the only bridge we had. So what we suggested to them was to make a bridge here. You can see at much higher ground, giving a 10 meter clearance. And we constructed a bridge which is 60 meters. And this bridge was launched in just one month. But this bridge had to be imported. Why imported? Because we didn't have anything better here. And we got the NHA officials to come and witness the launch. They were quite impressed by it. So what I'm saying is that for a long time, we have been stuck with the Bailey Bridge as the only bridge in emergencies. If you go to Google and just type collapsed Bailey Bridges, this is what comes up. One, two, three, four, five, six. And if you look at the tabs very carefully, it says Himachal Pradesh, Uttarkashi. Rotang Tunnel is also mentioned in dispatches. We lost a bridge there also. Uh, Mizoram, Kolkata. It is a universal problem. And these are going on collapsing faster because the axle loads are increasing. And everyone wants to take his sand truck, go to the other side and start constructing and the bridge collapses. And uh, what we do is 
we lock him up in jail because he used a heavy truck. We don't blame ourselves for giving him a weak bridge. The world has moved on to 2G bridges. If I call the Bailey Bridge the first, now what you saw launched was a 2G bridge. It's a gap in national capability for quicker bridge response. This clearly exists today. We have almost 500 of these Bailey Bridges along the LAC today, blocking our troops even from reaching the LAC because we had nothing else and we wanted quick bridges. In case we had bridges like the ACRO with us, there would be better response to emergencies. You won't launch weak bridges, you'll launch, uh, you'd launch strong bridges that will remain for days. You could construct detours which could take heavier loads. You could upgrade the capacity of hill roads because they are full of these weak bridges today. Quicker construction, new bridges, upgrades. In a city, if you had to replace a bridge and it took you two years, just imagine what happens to traffic. It was, if it was an ROB, imagine what happens to the rail traffic. And there are so many such bridges starting from Bombay which are 100 years old, which need to be replaced. The difference between a conventional bridge launch, which takes 18 months, and this bridge, which takes uh, three months or two months, is huge. And that is what people have to look at without looking at costs. As far as the cost of the bridge, which was launched uh, in Son Prayag, it was launched so that it meets the Yatra in time. The Yatra took place on time and the commercial gains were much, much more than the entire cost of the bridge. Now, this is a frame of mind that has to come. So we have to quickly graduate to 2G bridges, import if we have to, but along with that, develop the next generation bridge. And the 3G bridge should be something which is made in India, which we show others, but first, we have to understand the problem that there is a gap. Now, this is just one example of introducing a, uh, how do I stop the share? I don't need any more slides. Uh, so these were two aspects. We have to learn to manage our funds smoothly and better. And we have to look at the basics. And when we look at new technology, we should not be looking at single pieces of equipment coming in, but we should be identifying areas. And I have just suggested one. Uh, there would be many, many such more. And I'm sure many would come out with more ideas. Uh, I'll pause here. And if there's something else, yeah, I'll take yeah. it on in questions. Okay. Sir, I have a question for you. Yeah. What is that technology limitation which is stopping us from the 2G or 3G bridges being made in India? I see a big opportunity from your talk that this is a new area to be explored and exploited. What is it in terms of technology? We don't know that this area exists. As simple as that. <laughs> but nothing to do with fabrication, applied mechanics, material because i think we are uh, rich in it is it, it is it is not rocket science wonderful what, what people have done is the same bailey bridge has been made a little stronger the bailey bridge is a beautiful bridge uh, people say that the second world war was won thanks to the engineers thanks to the bailey bridge because we went across many places where people didn't imagine they could go but then that has now its limitations that it is just, it can take 12 tons. The moment you go to 30 meters, it can take only uh, 18 tons. That's nothing. 18 tons is less than a sand truck today. It comes to 20, 25 tons. So these bridges are collapsing. These bridges abroad 30 years back, they got the same bridge, made it bigger, made it wider and started using it. One reason why it is not coming in is because I had taken this up as the BRO and uh, I had almost threatened the people who manufacture these Bailey bridges here saying that if you don't get, go to the next generation, huh, uh, 
we won't call you an emergency bridge anymore because you're not meeting our requirements. So they started doing something, but what they've done in 10 years is not even equal to what is already happening abroad. No. We can't keep playing catch up on these things. We have to start using the best and then make something better. So the concept of approaching it has been a little laid back, but the main reason is nobody's questioned it. Nobody's, nobody's questioning the fact that on two lane, double lane highways in the mountains, we've got single lane bridges, which means we are utilizing that highway to half the capacity. Who's losing because of it? Most are quite confused as to whom to raise the issue with. So I'm making an attempt at getting awareness and I'm glad that it has registered with these few slides. No, this is phenomenal. This is something very, very uh, encouraging. And what is the uh, cost difference between a PSC bridge and this if we don't take timelines into consideration? I'm thinking from the point of view of these bridges being made as a standard because you cut down on time, you Im immediately create an and make things move. So uh, what is the usual uh, per meter cost? It, it's, it's, uh, uh, there are a few factors that come in. Every bridge is efficient at a certain span, at a certain length. So these bridges, I would say in the 40 to 60 meter spans. Okay. They would get competitive between 40 to 60 meters. So invariably, all the track crossings for national highways, this can be very effective. All the? There'll be track crossings on national highways, new national highways being built, which get terribly delayed in crossing the railway portion. Yes. These can span them in three months, two months with less uh, block timings. They can be very effective in creating very beautiful infrastructure across the country. They, they, they can be. So I think that is a great opportunity. They can be. Okay. And uh, uh, I, I am talking to some, but a little, uh, a little uh, leverage is required because most people think that something new like this cannot come and won't come. That is the attitude one has to fight against. Then others say, why import it? Why can't we make it? I right. said, of course we can make it. You start making it, it will come up in three to five years. But are you going to wait for five years to make a bridge in India? No one is going to take up manufacture till he's assured of a market. Absolutely. That is what is most crucial. So the day we get four or five bridges and make them and people realize there's a market, every guy who can weld will make this bridge. Absolutely. It's Sir, so simple. This, this, this exactly creating sustainability market is primarily dependent on creating the end user for all this infrastructure being created. Yes. Because see, just creating infrastructure for the sake of infrastructure means two, 3% of the taxpayer keeps bleeding for the development without actually seeing returns. Right. Yes. yes. This, is, this is where I have been talking to Dr. Shekhar on his idea and further pushing it further that we need to create a market in terms of utility for all these investments to be done. How do you create it? By creating distributed businesses across the country, by creating production centers, which actually are leveraging the low cost of labor, low cost of land, low cost of inputs, but overcoming the cost of transportation with low and efficient means of transportation back to the market as well, right? How can you do this? You can't do this by just keep pushing government to do it. You have to have magnets which attract businesses to different corners of the country. And this is where one place where I have been pushing this idea for ages now, I would call. I'm saying, how can you pump up the economy across the country? You need sir, some anchor. That anchor in most cases is government. If you see all businesses primarily thrive on government spending. Government to spend requires taxpayers to pay. How long, how far? I have an idea. You have close to 350 CPSUs in the country. 
174 plus are consistently profitable because they are being driven by leaders as you say rightfully taking right decisions timely decisions whatever you call or in niche areas all of them have their headquarters invariably in metros and mini metros why today with connectivity you can afford to be in any corner of this world and still do business because what does a corporate do decision making policy making ideation the actual work gets done by the field units so if i can shift just the decision makers to remote corners of this country i can make the remote corners viable because all those who buy for business with these decision makers would open up offices or interaction units at these remote corners and in turn you create self fulfilling infrastructure at all these places what i have been speaking on is you have invested in new smart cities they are still to see viability but if i pick up a profitable cpsu cmb and a functional director and shift them to one of these places all the business ecosystem which deals with these automatically rushes to these places because out of sight is out of mind once they are there a paying population is there everything that drives a city so called city business entertainment education health uh, services everything grows because now you have somebody to pay for it similarly how do you get employees to run these shows by the catchment area people so they no longer have to run to metros are you getting me sir so yeah. i am having that issue that if i can push the top 100 cash is cpsu cmd and functional directors to one new virgin smart city i am not talking about ready made smart cities if i push people to hyderabad pune nagpur i am further messing up you see the floods do you see the floods damaging hyderabad you don't need to choke and block the existing cities you ought to create alternate centers of livelihood and if i can do this whether it is investment in bridges whether it is investment in fiber whether it is the honorable pm thinking of taking fiber to all 6 lakh villages would exactly do this because once i can drive a successful business sitting in a remote corner in a small village whether it is software development whether it is artificial intelligence whether it is to do with a call center whether it is to do with a support center for the latest gizmo that you have bought you bought an apple iphone 12 i can support you from chermiri why should i be sitting in gurgaon but if i am well connected i can give employment to the local people who can give you support in local language i can have somebody sitting in arkonam or nemeli and giving a support in tamil to an iphone buyer in uh, iphone 12 why should i be supporting him from somebody in gurgaon delhi mumbai or calcutta if i can do this sir we create a beautiful new tomorrow why you solve the problem of migrant labor they don't have to come and live a life of filthiness below human standards in all metros we don't bother sitting in ac rooms talking in beautiful environments about what happens to the poor man who travels leaving his family behind comes and lives in a shanty in mumbai delhi all his life thinking of going back some day to live happily with his family that never arrives covid all kinds of things kills him before he really enjoys what he has slogged for all his life if i can create job opportunities for that person closer home he can take care of his parents we can go back to your family care uh, what we have been rich in all throughout india is known for a family structure this is breaking up because of people being forced to leave their families and go back to uh, search of livelihood where they can't take their families along let's look at this as an idea if we can push this to happen we can create a happy that is what is my dream sir yeah that is something which is uh, where we have also been discussing together because that's the only solution available see once a psu goes uh, i have personally talked to psus on paper they don't have any objection and it is a question of some systems coming in picture now coming to little uh, in continuity uh, to whatever Uh, general has said you know whatever general has said is something which can probably get back that 8 lakh crores which is supposed to be struck up in infrastructure today infrastructure is getting a bad name reserve bank is banning anything in infrastructure please don't fund because 8 lakh is they consider just because maybe 10% of them may be crooks they consider whole 100% as crooks and and it is genuine problem 
whatever example which has given is a genuine problem which is true for 90% of the cases 10% of course may may or may not be can't back here but that's a black sheep everybody so that is something which should be taken in should be taken on individual basis rather than putting the whole industry as a in in one uh, platter second about the bridges which is that just like you rightly said is just a one example okay like this there are many which are required bridges the, the bridge uh, in in uh, charni road broke about two years back and it killed 100 people and there are many which are killing on a daily basis which is a smaller bridge which doesn't even press get bored of reporting the same thing again and again so they all should be taken into bridges taken as as if something which is non technical non uh, wifi oriented means it is not worth reporting no same way the combination which is going to work and like uh, general rightly pointed out it is just not the question of you know why should we do it is a question of what is the objective for doing it then why should we do it will automatically come and little more i want to of course hear from ashutosh ashutosh is somebody who is fully you know has done his homework well has done his uh, you know history geography you say anything means he is even gone to the level of which you know psu can go where and how they will benefit it is not the question of because today in psu if somebody is told to go to remote placement is a penalty you know we have downgraded him that portion has to be removed we should in fact one of the small solutions which ashutosh himself should do as a scope uh, a board member is to say that i am promoting you up i mean i am promoting you by making you go to a remote place you know if that feeling comes maybe the mindset will go today if anybody is going from x to y even in ministry some ministry are supposed to be number one some ministry number two i don't know why why is statistics ministry considered low because statistics ministry is the one which controls all the numbers same way here to if i stay in bombay it is something great even in bombay if i stay in kolaba it is something great whereas something called kandivali is there which is far better than kolaba in today's case because that has come out of something like ashudosh idea that somebody when say i am psu i am putting it there maybe it's not a real psu and then they have made it far far better than what the most advanced city could be and like that many satellite cities have come so one more small idea where i would like ashutosh to highlight is we can also build satellite cities you know see today delhi and mumbai would be one of the best best cities in the world if the population is around 10 million with 22 million people it is the most collapsed city you know it is collapsed from all angles but suppose we create satellite cities we create eight satellite cities around delhi and mumbai they will be the beautiful city maybe we should start some of the psus to first go to the satellite city which means they got best of both yes i am in new delhi 1 new delhi 2 new delhi 3 new delhi 4 same way bombay should have new bombay 1 new bombay 2 new bombay 3 some 8 that is one idea second of course is you know you ensure that the infrastructure is somewhere created uh, you know parallelly today we say you go there and then we create infrastructure even a parallel infrastructure is created and some aura is created that when you go there yes you will have something good and it is it is it is laid out as a matter of mandate then it will go maybe ashutosh can must be because he has done a huge work and he is so emotionally attached to this portion and uh, with all his facts and figures in place i would like him to uh, say few uh, points which of course much of it is already told but something more on sir in fact in fact i would like to tell you there was a survey done even before covid in gurgaon general survey and 40% of the people were willing to go to their hometowns if they could get the same salaries or they could preserve their jobs why because the cost of living the time spent in travel the pollution levels it hardly any time left with families and the growing disconnect in society because what is happening is all these metros becoming the only hubs for employment are driving people to come from villages anybody who declares himself or herself as having completed his, his or her education whether it is 8 pass 12 pass graduation engineering or whatever it is runs to a metro for a job but a metro as you rightly said cannot afford to give job to everybody then you have a class of haves and have nots very clearly visible somebody in a bmw another man not able to afford a vada pav this 
we do not realize but the kind of animosity growing in the society because of difference in what i can afford and another person cannot think of is getting into enhanced crime rates and that to very very vicious crimes earlier people were afraid of snatching somebody's earrings without damaging that person now you see they are ruthless they would plug your earrings without bothering whether that person is losing her ear lobes why they just not bothered they say why it is not my mistake to be born in a family which cannot afford a good life for me so if you can't give me i would snatch it this is making all your big cities unsafe night times you are afraid of traveling in most of the cities alone why car jacking car snatching chain snatching robberies decoities these are all signs of a broken society if instead i can create a decent life for an individual close to his house where he can afford a decent life without spending maybe 60 or 70% of his salary on his accommodation on his travel on his food and can spend time with his family i think we would be creating a happy and healthy society now coming to your question of if we shift people would they mind trust me if i can create a walk to work culture for all the people who are being shifted they would start enjoying that life because they would be able to spend their quality time with their families which is being missed today all those people who are saying i am staying in mumbai i am staying in delhi i am staying in calcutta i am staying in chennai or bangalore sir the fact is they just go home to barely sleep the rest of the time is spent in morning two and a half hours of travel evening two and a half hours of travel what is life there is no life left if i can this is because they haven't seen the other side of the life trust me if we can shift people to places where they can walk to work come back within time they would be more productive because their 6 or 8 hours spent in office would be really devoted to the work for which they are being engaged rather than being worried about which train to catch which local to catch which connection to depend on what to buy or en route you are out of it you can have a healthier life you can have a more peaceful life you can save money for your tomorrow and today not just tomorrow but today because your cost of living goes down your transportation cost goes down your living cost goes down your infrastructure cost goes down and the company is becoming profitable can be, be paying more incentives bonuses performance related pay so overall you would see there may be an initial innovation but people would start enjoying the new normal today in gurgaon maybe 40 50% of the houses are worrying for tenants because people are leaving and going back to their home towns and getting connected most of the it industry most of the call center industry are you aware most of the call centers in mumbai are now recruiting people saying if you are connected if you have a device at home then you are on job otherwise you are not on job are you aware most of the call centers in mumbai i have started doing this and there have been businesses spun who would provide you connectivity a chair table and a device on pay per month basis in order to so there are new business models coming in i see huge value sir we just have to push it once and it becomes a self fulfilling prophecy it becomes auto driven because people start enjoying the new life and overall a healthy and happy ecosystem kicks in and as i had talked to you like you have been talking about the maha samruddhi maha marg you have some 23 new smart cities coming how would you make them viable shift man cpc see satellite city is what happens like delhi has gurgaon and noida now if you create work in gurgaon or you create work in noida most of the people in delhi would not shift it only increases the traffic in morning and evening makes it a mess 500 cars in a line spewing venom instead you should create a good livable new city so that people don't have to travel again because if you travel again you're losing the essence of what the idea is you should create self sustainable happy living isolated independent cities you can enjoy life there that is what is the aim uh, absolutely absolutely yeah uh, i just uh, yeah. even when you started you started with the idea of how covid has made a difference in our attitudes uh, the fact is covid has shown us how much of redundancy redundancy is there in our lives there is so much less we can manage with 
there is so much we can do without. And when we start rebuilding ourselves after COVID, we can actually start making a fresh start in, in many things. I don't have to socialize as much as I thought I had to. I don't need to possess as much as I thought I had to. I can stay at home and work, which has been something that you've been talking about. Now, uh, these are the things that we have to uh, leverage now. And before people forget these things, we have to start building environments around them. Uh, and many of the ideas that you said, I think would work as far as this is concerned, it would work better in a post COVID scene. Sir, in fact, uh, now with virtualization of offices, you can actually have your virtual rooms and you can avoid air conditioning cost, you can avoid sanitization cost, you can avoid travel cost, you can avoid security cost, bring in new levels of efficiency. Yes. I, I can enter your room with your permission digitally. Instead of having a mobile number or an email address, you can have a virtual room address. That is what you give to people and with excess rights, somebody comes to your room. If you want, like you come to my room and you say, why don't we meet Mr. Shekhar? I can take you to his room digitally because this is a reality now and we can share and do everything that we want just digitally. Imagine the saving. Now, what happens to the space created in terms of office? They can be production centers. Why do you need offices to be squatting on very costly properties in South Mumbai or in South Delhi or in uh, Bangalore, heart of the city, when I can afford doing all that I do from an office from a remote corner? Much more healthier, much more cleaner, much more safer, much more beautiful a life to live and equally effective. So the decision makers no longer need to waste their time in travel, no longer need to commute at a cost, spend their valuable time in proactive decision making. As you rightly said, we require leaders, we require decisive people, we require people with vision, we require people with a commitment to the cause. And all this can be digitally attained. And sir, the biggest advantage of digitization is transparency, accountability, and ownership with kick in big time. And that is what has to be the norm to take the country to greater heights. I think with good infrastructure, we can do this. Yeah, I think we have had excellent uh, debate. So coming to the core topic of transportation to conclude, transportation, good transportation, well needed systems in transportation is of course a must. But at the same time, it may have to be recalibrated in the new environment. Much of whatever work to home should continue post-COVID. It should not be stunned away. But that doesn't mean that offices need not be there the way it is today. Today, offices are not working, which is not correct. Offices to the level of its core work, and like uh, Ashuda said, a virtual office should permanently be there and the real going should come based on necessity. Then the transportation will be based on our need. It will not be based on our greed. To show to people, we just say, yes, I'm going. I took uh, you know, first class, I took an executive class, I stayed in <laughs> seven star hotel, which is only when it is absolutely required. By that, by no means should seven star and five star hotel stop uh, working. They need not be over overpopulated, over over, uh, Pampered. And last but not the least is take things on a necessity basis, things which are technology. We should not technology for, take technology for the sake of technology. Like many times, many, many people feel, oh, use artificial intelligence, I'll remove people, which is not correct. In fact, artificial intelligence should encourage more people to be more profitably employed because India generates whatever it is uh, in everything. We generate 20 million new people every year. So we have to provide. The 20 million new jobs for somebody who was born 20 million uh, people who are born 20 years back. So it is our duty also to not give frustration, not only by this migrant, run, even by the people who are born in a place which is there. And that comes by proper planning of transportation, proper planning of the cities, and proper planning of the environment around the cities. And this environment can come on a committed basis. 
which the excellent idea with Ashutosh has been saying and which he said now also that, you know, some anchor company which is there. It is anchor company, he says, 170 are there. In my, by my own projection, I, we need almost 500 smart cities. Smart city does not mean just a word. Smart city need not be something, you know, complex. It is a question of bringing, bringing people happiness in today's environment. Not that people are unhappy. I'm not considering a villagers as unhappy. But when a villager sees so many glamour around a city, he feels little be little. So something of that should go there also. So it should be go to the level of six and a half lakh smart villagers should be there. And smart city does not mean you overpopulate people and make everybody rush to the city and then get frustrated at the end of the life, no quality of life, no this thing, staying away from family. That gives rise to so much of other, you know, uh, crimes, mind blocks, and so on and so forth. So this all can be minimized. So with that, I would like to only conclude by saying that we need to have good transportation, we need to have planned transportation, and we need to have cities which are catering to a good transport internally and externally. At the same time, this transportation need not be overused. You can sit at home and still use the transportation in a nice, neat way. With that, I'll conclude. I'll thank both our esteemed uh, uh, experts. Uh, Ashutu, you want to say something? No, I, I primarily said basically, sir, I just want to say one thing yeah. Yeah. that any efficiency tool that you bring in actually creates more opportunities for engaging more and more people because your bottom line grows. Absolutely. When I'm growing my business, I need more people in different places. So a person who has been utilized for a particular job, if I use AI or RPA or de uh, deep learning or machine learning, the same person can be productive and reskilled and can be put on a more useful job than what he was doing as a repetitive thing, which was not required. Yeah. You bring in more efficiency, you create more value. That is what is the... Absolutely. Absolutely. With that, uh, I will uh, conclude and thank uh, both the uh, experts. Thank you very much. And uh, we, would, uh, we, we, we would see more of you. Thank as you. Thank you so much.